Welcome in. I'm Colette Wheeland alongside Dr. Stephen Camerata. Steve is the author of Late Talking Children, A Symptom or a Stage. This book is now in its second edition. We've been having conversations about the topics in this book. And one of the ones that we started in a previous podcast is about late talking children and autism. So first and foremost, more and more late talking children are mistakenly put on the autism spectrum. And why is that? So historically, autism was a very specific condition that included reduced motivation for social communication and a strict adherence to routines. And, and it was actually a relatively rare condition. More recently, there's been a tremendous expansion in the autism spectrum so that even someone, an adult who's socially awkward, may be put on the autism spectrum. And so the reality is that although almost all children with autism are late talking, certainly not the case that late talking, that all late talking children have autism. In fact, most late talking children do not have autism. But because these children are being put on the spectrum, they're also in many cases being given questionable treatment. And what's the harm in that? So um, the reality is that if you have a reduced motivation for social communication and a reliance on routines, that requires a very specific treatment. But if you don't have those features, the treatment you use for autism can actually be harmful. And so we should never take a late talking child who doesn't have autism and say, well, he'll just get services, so it's okay to take the autism label. That's actually gonna have detrimental effects on their development. Also, having an autism label changes the dynamic between the parent and the child. And so it just has a lot of negative impact. So child has autism, we definitely wanna come in and support. It takes a lot of effort. And certainly some late talking children do have autism and it's important to know the difference, but we never wanna accept an inaccurate label. And certainly we don't wanna treat a child for autism when they don't have autism. That's really foundational and crucial. In the, in the book, you describe this questionable, and I say it with quotation marks because it was very specific. So what, what does questionable treatment look like? Sure, so one of the main treatments that we give to children with autism, or some people, I actually don't recommend this, except for the more severe cases of autism, but one of the main treatments that children get is called ABA. And that's where the child is um, prompted to speak. So um, the, the basic idea is that you teach the child to speak as you would a parrot or something like that, where you, you maybe show them an object or a flashcard and say, say, say book, and then you give them a food reward or something like that. And the idea is that the motivation to communicate is so low, you've got to come in and essentially use these really um, high pressure types of things to draw the words out of them. Again, I don't recommend that really even for most children who have autism, but we certainly don't want to do that with late talkers who don't have autism. It can actually result in the child speaking less. It changes the whole social dynamic and social development. And so it's really something we want to avoid. Some of the children with uh, some of the late talking children have some anxiety, even though they don't have autism, and that can make them even more anxious. The other thing is that if a child resists those kinds of prompts, they're learning that the coming to the adult actually results in, in something that they don't like. And so they end up talk, talking less out rather than more. So there's lots of reasons to really avoid that treatment if it's not appropriate for their child. There are parents who go to some extreme measures to help their child talk, even these questionable treatments, and, and their child does show some signs of progress. So even if they start talking, can you know, maybe it gives them a false sense of being cured. Um, why is that so dangerous? Right, so um, late, for late talking children who the late talking is a stage, they're actually gonna get, they're gonna, they're gonna improve regardless, unless you actually do something like ABA that slows down their growth. Um, they're gonna talk anyway, all right? You can't really stop them unless you derail it. And so let's say I come in and I say, oh, you know, here's a vitamin or, here's a detox program, or here's a magic uh, app that's gonna wire their brain or something like that. The person giving that is gonna falsely believe that that's what caused the talking. And so there's a lot of superstitious treatments that come in and a lot of times they're marketed very heavily and they're gonna work in over half the cases if they're being misdiagnosed as having autism because the children are gonna talk anyway. One of the examples in the book is um, one of the cases I saw a number of years ago um, was, a, was a little girl, a little toddler, and um, my evaluation showed that the late talking was very likely to be a stage and she was gonna grow out of it. And during the six month period um, that I monitored her, I recorded her every month using the camcorder. Back then we had VHS, this is a while ago, it was a camcorder VHS. And 
Sure enough, she had this massive language burst. So within a six month period, she went from being behind to actually being ahead. And for many years, her mom would come to me and say, thank you so much for helping my child learn to talk. And I kept telling her, you might as well thank Panasonic. They made the VHS recorder. She was gonna talk anyway. But because I was seeing her and monitoring her progress, mom thought I was doing something to actually promote her talking, but she was gonna talk anyway. And that's a classic example. So let's say I said, hey, um, I'm going to rub your child with spoons, as was one of the recommendations in one of the books was to rub the child's skin with spoons. Um, let's say I, I did a blood transfusion. Let's say I injected stem cells, you name it. Let's say I did some kind of transcortical stimulation with electricity. I think that people would believe that that's what caused her to talk, when in reality, she was going to talk anyway. Well, that, that's what I was going to ask you. The next question is, um, you see patients from all over the country, all over the world. <laughs> What are some of those bizarre treatments? I know you've just described some <laughs> right. spoons. That's different. Yeah. But. So in a very popular book, um, the mom, she did lots of things. That particular child had epilepsy. So the, he, he got medicine for his seizures and then he started talking. And that's probably what, what got things going. But she did a bunch of other things too. And so um, one of the things she did was she rubbed his arm and his shoulders with spoons. And that was in her book talking about it. And she believed that helped him. Um, another... Um, thing I think is a little bit bizarre is though um, they have these things called hyperbaric chambers for um, they're good for treating people with burns. And then if a diver comes up too quickly and gets the bends, they're going to put them in this chamber to compress them. There's a theory that if you put a child, a late talking child in one of those, you're actually putting more oxygen in their brain and it, it, it'll like improve their talking or cure their autism. So there's these hyperbaric treatments, which again, these things are just really bizarre. Where, where's the science to support that? That, that even puts um, that information So out? most of the time, it's like what I just said, there's like this theory, oh, you know, the late talking is caused or the autism is caused by not having enough oxygen in the brain, put them in this hyperbaric chamber, it forces more oxygen in. Okay. Um, a lot of times nutritional things are like, well, you know, we know that there's uh, fatty sheaths around nerve shells called myelin. And so if we just give them this kind of nutritional thing or these really expensive vitamins, that that'll cause the myelinization to happen. Um, all of them have like a slight germ of truth. Um, there's been all these treatments where um, they'll maybe slow down. Uh, they'll, they'll have a child listen to headphones, so they'll take the speech and slow it down, or they'll take music and take out certain frequencies. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of these really bizarre okay. treatments that are more, marketed to parents. More yeah. like old wives' tales, but... Well, again, they, they, they are that, although I hate to say old wives' tales because actually old wives know a lot <laughs> and they have a lot <laughs> of wisdom. True. But having said that, um, there, there are often um, things that are marketed on the Internet or there are things that, you know, parents say. Like one, one uh, case I remember, there was a nurse and um, I saw her son and I thought it was that this late talking was a stage. There was also a pediatrician who said the same thing to her. And both of us said, within a year, your child's going to be talking well. Well, she went to uh, an alternative specialist and he said, well, he has toxicity. And so he did this detox program. So he starts talking great within a year, like we predicted. And she would write these blogs online about how this detox program cured her son's autism. Well, she has a belief in that and she's a nurse, so she has, you know, she's smart. Um, but just because she was so worried about her son and then someone was able to market this alternative treatment, she has a belief in it and she's per fairly eloquent. And so, you know, she kind of um, provided a, you know, a following and a platform for that treatment, even though it really doesn't have any benefit. What I always say to people is, if I diagnose a child with autism um, and, and you provide a treatment and it, and it improves their autism and cures it, I will endorse it. And so far after 40 years, no one's ever taken me up on that. So if you say, hey, I'm gonna cure the autism with a detox, or I'm gonna cure it by rubbing spoons on their body or whatever it is, um, I'll say, great, you do that and you let me pick the case. And if they get better, I will absolutely endorse your product. So, so far that hasn't happened. Has not happened. Right. You, you talked about uh, chelation. In chelation. Chelation, yeah, excuse chelation, me, right. pardon me. Um, chelation in the book, how is that relevant to late talkers? Um, so that really is a story that comes in uh, for autism. There was a belief that, um, Autism was called, caused by a vaccine injury, specifically the mercury that was, in a, was a, one of the preservatives in vaccines back prior to around the year 2000. There was actually a whole series of articles on this, some of them appearing in very prestigious journals. They, some of them had actually been withdrawn because uh, one of the people um, who 
did the science actually faked his data, which is not good. <laughs> you know, that's really bad. And um, so um, the basic idea is that the autism story was that there were these toxins. So you get a child who is misdiagnosed as having autism. And then they say, okay, the reason he has autism is because of these toxins. So chelation, like so many of these things, is actually a well-accepted medical treatment. So if your child eats lead paint or something, get them to the hospital right away. And they have this way of getting the lead, the, the acute lead poisoning out of their blood. And again, I'm not a physician. I'm, I'm just telling you generally what I know about it. Sure. You know, I'm, not, I'm not giving any medical advice. But the bottom line is that there really is this detox, if you will, that takes out heavy metals. But chronic types of things and you know, this idea that the mercury is causing autism is just not true. And so that's what people build on. They take, say, a medical treatment like chelation that has a very limited use. It's like um, another one, another treatment that's actually kind of really popular now is called vagal nerve stimulation. And that's been approved um, for certain kinds of epilepsy where they implant a, a uh, stimulator that actually stimulates the vagus nerve, which is one of the cranial nerves that affects breathing and autonomic function um, stasis. And the idea is that um, that can actually, it's actually recommended for um, epilepsy, but now it's like uh, people are marketing it for autism and all their kinds of things. And again, there's not a good evidence base for that. So why are those types of treatments dangerous for late talking children? Um, so chelation actually, um, there's, there were some deaths from it and there's some, some harm, so they're not risk-free. Um, I don't know the risks, if there's any risks with vagal nerve stimulation. I, I don't, I haven't heard of any risks other than the fact that it's expensive and you're also taking away or not what we call an opportunity cost for more effective treatments. You really want to be teaching them how to talk. They're in there because they're late talking. They're not in there because, you know, they need their vagal nerve stimulation. It's really interesting to me that, you know, I have a family that comes in and everybody agrees the child's talking late. And then I say, okay, we're going to teach them how to talk, which seems like what we should do. And then people are offering vitamins or special diets or vagal nerve stimulation or headphones with altered input and let's teach them how to talk. Let's, let's do that. Let's focus on that. And that's, there's a lot of science, a lot of studies to show that's beneficial. Yeah. So what is, what's your advice for these parents, the parents that might be considering questionable treatment? So number one, talk to your pediatrician. You never want to put your child in danger. And some of these things are, um, medically dangerous. In fact, I was just so happy when uh, the FDA specifically said, we don't want you doing key chelation for autism and that's off the table. But there's, you know, it takes a while. Sometimes people come up with these new ideas and then we have to see a lot of negative side effects before they get banned. And then, you know, really for a lot of people, they try these things it, and if the child really has uh, late talking as a symptom and not a stage, they don't really get better. So they, they don't help. Um, there's a certain psychology to it too, though. I remember one parent I talked to, um, I, you know, I said, hey, look, this isn't going to work. It's not going to help. And she said to me, you know what? I believe you. Um, but, you know, I can't, I have to do everything I can to help my child. And so some of these people marketing these things take advantage of that worry and fear that parents have that something that they, and they're going to try everything. And as long as something's benign, you know, I'm, I'm not going to push it as much. But if something's harmful, it's very important not to do that. So, you know, well, that's the first thought that came to my mind is if, I, if I'm a parent and, and there's a possible solution out there, right, I'm going to I'm going to work towards that. Yeah. So yeah. But, but you're saying there, there's there can be a harm. There in, can be. And that's why I always get a medical evaluation, always get the hearing tested and always, always, you know, check with your pediatrician to make sure if you're putting them on a diet or you're giving them like uh, another treatment is whopper doses of vitamin B that are injected. And if you go, my understanding, again, this is medical stuff, but my understanding is if you do, if you put in too much vitamin B, that also can be toxic to the child. So before you do any kind of treatment like that, that's biomedical, um, you know, just be sure you talk to, you know, your family doc or your, or your pediatrician to make sure you're not doing any harm. That's step one. And again, I would just urge everybody to step back and say, why am I bringing my child to the specialist. And it's because if it's because they're not talking, then we want to teach them how to talk. I know that sounds super simple, but there's a lot of science behind it. And it's really what we should be doing. Well, how do you talk to parents, you personally, mm -hmm. who yeah. are demanding that their child needs some sort of treatment? Well, so I would say they do need treatment. We're going to, we're going to help them. And even, even when the lay talking is a stage, I'm going to do parent coaching, you know, teach them how to like harness natural development and accelerate it. So, I mean, just normal, natural parent-child interaction is highly beneficial. 
and engages neuroplasticity and has just a ton of benefits. So I'm going to teach them how to do that, you know, at the very least. And then I'm going to monitor them to see what's going on. And if more treatments needed, I'm going to recommend that. But if you mean by treatment, something like, oh, you know, I'm going to put them on a gluten-free diet or something like that, that really should be medically indicated. And I'm going to talk to them about determining whether that's actually beneficial or not for their child. At this point, is there any science to support what you put in your body food wise to suggest your child's going to be a late talker or otherwise? So there's no um, nutrition or diet that's been shown to be associated with late talking. Um, You know, there's general things. uh, So for example, there is really a disease called celiac disease where people can really have a severe reaction to wheat, um, gluten and wheat. And, you know, in extreme cases that can really derail development. And so there there are some. Um, One of the examples I like to use is PKU which is a metabolic condition where if a child eats certain kinds of proteins in their diet, that they will end up um, actually having intellectual disability and developmental delay. So there are, there are, there are certain dietary conditions that they can derail it, but those are relatively rare. And they're metabolic. So there's not any specific link between um, a certain um, diet or a certain deficiency in late talking. Okay. Now I will say that something like fetal alcohol syndrome you know, where um, say prenatally someone's drinking to excess, that that can be associated with late talking, you know, but they're more extreme medical conditions than okay. that. So, and I always say, you know, to mothers, mothers are not causing it. Mothers get blamed for so many things. In fact, there was a theory of autism that the mothers were withholding their emotional support. It's called refrigerator moms. And it was just, it was so terrible and just such an awful thing. So, um, ex- in, unless you're absolutely neglecting your child in a way that's clinically unusual, you didn't cause the late talking for sure. Oh, I remember that in the book, you talked about a, a, an example of twins, right? One of them yeah. having autism, the other not. Right. And so did the mom right. somehow, selectively, yeah. yeah. Did the mom selectively withhold her emotional support from one twin over the other? I mean, just things like yeah. that, or, you know, you have an older, older child that's developing or a younger child that's developing fine. It's the same parents. So why is this actually the thing that's causing the late talking or causing the autism? It just doesn't work that but way. But to be honest with you, I mean, it goes through my mind. I'm like, no, why absolutely. is this one unruly, for instance, yeah, and right. this one's not? I parent them the same way. It, you know, they each come yeah, out. So of in, in my case, you know, um, I'm a late talker, so you know, yeah, for my late talking son. I probably caused it by <laughs> conveying some kind of genetic risk for late talking, if you think of it that way. So, uh, so Mary's a wonderful the moms, mother. We can no, yeah, it. well, it's yeah. Stop mm-hmm. blaming the moms and moms. Please, please don't have guilt. I know it's easy for me to say that, but it comes to territory. But yeah, moms didn't cause it. So, and I, again, I think some of the people marketing these treatments really either consciously or unconsciously know that, and they're they're just feeding that, you know, and, and, the, and the worry that the mom has, and then they can use that then to market their products. And I, I detest that, but it, you know, it's the reality of things. I want to talk about uh, classic autism mm-hmm. and late talkers there. Um, what kind of behavioral treatment should, you know, those, those families seek? So if a child has um, classic autism, um, we have to do really good detective work to figure out when the child's initiating. So, um, it, you know, all kinds of late talkers, except for those with classic autism, and then also typical children, they're going to initiate and engage with the parent, if not verbally, because they're late talking, they're going to do it non-verbally. So they might look at the cup there and look at it, then look at the parent, and they're engaging social bids. And there's a whole cycle of initiation and, and modeling that, that comes along with that. Children with autism don't do that, so they're missing out on all these learning opportunities. Now, on the other hand, they will communicate in some ways. They might pull someone's hand to the refrigerator when they want something. Um, And by the way, a lot of children do that, so that's not a symptom of autism, but children with autism will do that. So we're trying to figure out when they initiate and what their motivation is to communicate so we can then build on that. It takes really good detective work. And then um, when a child with autism has a tantrum or they engage in self-injury or some of the things they do, that often is communicative as well. So we have to do detective work to say, okay, can we teach them a replacement behavior instead of the tantrum, instead of the, the self-injury um, to communicate? So a child, a child with autism hitting their head may be communicating, gosh, you know, I don't really want to be here responding to your prompts, you know, <laughs> and they can't really say that, you know. Actually, one thing that popped into my mind, there was a, uh, a late talker with apraxia and the parent treated it with acupuncture and they kept sticking um, needles in the child's face. And then with apraxia, there's variable ability to speak. 
And the child said, eventually said, stop sticking those needles in my face. It hurts. Were those <laughs> their first words? Um, <laughs> it wasn't her first words, but, you know, she was she was communicating that, you know, verbally. And she had a praxis. So she couldn't do that well. But the parent was well-meaning, but, you know, sticking the needles in the face was not really an effective treatment for apraxia. So anyway, my point is that she was experiencing pain from that but couldn't communicate it. And she was, you know, throwing tantrums, but the parents were attributing it to something else. But really it was... Uh, you know, I don't really want you sticking needles in my face. And so the disruptive behavior can be communicative and a, a good skilled clinician can figure out what they're doing and do the detective work and then figure out how to teach them how to communicate that. And it may, it may be with words, but it may be other types of things. It could be using a picture card. It could be using sign language. We're trying to teach a replacement behavior that's more effective for them and less aversive for them and less aversive for the parents. Is that the focused teaching method that you're describing? Or yeah, what? so, um, and we might we might actually do ABA. So if a child responds to prompting, that is they'll imitate on demand, and they really do need a food reward in order to interact, then we might use that. That's actually rare. Um, you know, we don't need to do that very often. Right now, they kind of do it with everybody, and that's definitely not indicated. But, you know, certainly we have it in our toolkit for some children, but it's, it's an extreme situation. Um, the example I, I like to use, um, and I may have said this before in one of the other podcasts, but it's like um, saying someone's on the diabetes spectrum, which could include pre-diabetes, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and saying, okay, everybody on the diabetes spectrum is going to get insulin. Well, only about 15% of diabetics on average are, are type 1s, like I am, and need insulin to live. And so if you do a one-size-fits-all treatment, that and that's extreme. Like, I, you know, I wear an insulin pump. I have to take injections. It's extreme. You won't want to do that with everybody if they don't need it. And in fact, with diabetes, you actually will end up killing people that don't need that treatment, yeah. right? So same thing with ABA. So for autism, you really need a skilled clinician. It's not a one-size-fits-all. You have to get into that child's motivation and figure out how to meet them where they are and help them communicate in a way that's effective for them when they don't have the usual motivational pattern to talk with people and, and be engaged with people. In, in the book, you talk about the need for prompting a late talker with autism. So how is that approach different than how you would approach a late talker without autism? So um, we have, we've done a whole series of studies and there's actually hundreds and hundreds of studies to show that the most effective way to teach a toddler in a preschooler who doesn't have autism is for them to initiate and then for us just to respond naturally. So when a child looks up and they walk over and they touch a car and they look at the parent, that's a teachable moment and you just say car. You don't have to say to them, say car. You don't have to pull the words out. If you do that enough, they'll start saying car on their own. Now, late talkers will do it later. They're late talkers. But <laughs> that, that kind of natural, um, you know, it's called naturalistic behavioral intervention is just highly effective. And that's our, our main go-to. Um, when a child is a little older, like let's say they have a speech pronunciation problem where they're saying W for R or something like that. Well, some of the late talkers do that. Then when they're in school, you can kind of talk to them and kind of coach them on how to make those sounds. But prior to that, you just don't have to do that. So we only use prompting um, when, you know, again, the child will, will not get upset when you prompt them. So about half the children, they'll have a tantrum when you prompt them. So stop immediately. And for those that readily prompt, you can use that as a platform for building. But really what you want to do is harness the initiations, the social initiations, the naturally occurring teachable moments and learning to identify those and learning to encourage those so the child um, you know, develops language in the usual way. And the social use of language, conversation, all those things come out of that. So it's really important. And when a late talker starts to talk, that doesn't necessarily mean they enjoy it, right? Or that they want to engage in conversation. So what kind of advice do you have for parents who are excited that my, my child's finally talking, yeah, but they so don't really want it to. Is, it is fun to watch. The parents will send me tapes, you know, and the child will do that first word. And then they want them to do it over and over again. And if you think about it, so when a child comes up and looks at mom and says, mama, you know, that's an initiation. And it may be, hey, mom, you know, I want to watch TV with you or show me a video. Or it may be, hey, I want to play with you. And then the mom turns around and I'm not blaming the mom. Let's do dad instead. So come and say dad. And then dad says, hey, you said dad, say dad, say dad, say dad. And they're like, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I just was trying to say hi to you so I can play with you. I don't really want to perform on demand. <laughs> and so that's, that's what happens. And I, I understand the parents are so excited when they yeah. do that, you know, and they want to hear it over and over again, because it's reassuring. Um, so we do want to think about things. We need to learn to think like a child and really see it from their perspective. What is it they're trying to communicate and then build on that? So, um, we really don't need to do a lot of prompting. And then 
late talkers on average tend to be interested in in um, you know different things. It may be trains, maybe dinosaurs uh, for the boys. It may be um, different kinds of cook sets and things for the girls. And I don't mean to be stereotypical here. These are just broad averages. You're gonna have girls that like dinosaurs and boys that like cookware and so on. But anyway, they're gonna really be wanting to talk about that. And so initially, at least, you just want to let them talk about what they're interested in and follow along with that. Over time, you can kind of guide that so they're sharing the conversation and they'll talk about your topics as well. But yeah, late talkers like to talk about the things they're interested in, at least initially. And really, to be honest with you, really for their whole life, <laughs> certainly true. You know, late talkers, you know, have an analytical kind of mind and, and they tend to be interested in, in um, the the topics and things that they're that they find um, engaging, and they're going to focus on those more often. I want to kind of end here talking about patience. Yes. Patience is important. It's a key factor here, right, for parents and with it, their It really topic. is. And I think one of the things that, that's happened now, especially with the internet and all the information, is people might look at a checklist or they might see some children uh, playing and they see certain things, and then they're going to see their lay talker and they're going to say, oh my gosh, you know. My child, you know, doesn't have their first words at, at 12 months, not really realizing that the average age of when first words comes in, excuse, variable between nine and 18 months. And that's really typical. And so there's that just to saying that it's not an exact time, but also you want to kind of watch the lay talker and see where they are developmentally. And they, they might be behind for a, for a while, but um, at least half of them or more are just going to catch up. They're just on a slightly slower clock. So we want to be patient. We don't want to rush things. Uh, again, the way our education system is, we put it, everybody at a certain grade level, they have these generic benchmarks. And because so many of them are talking, people are going to push those, you know, and rush them. And really, patience is important. My only talking son, it took him a long time to learn how to read. And then later podcast, we're going to talk about, you know, the middle school age for late, the middle school journey for late talkers. And if we had tried to really pound reading in him, he probably would have hated reading. And he certainly would have learned that he's not a good reader and that reading is something he likes. We fast forward to college. He has a degree in poli sci. He's one of my, of all my children, he reads a lot. Um, and the reason is we were very patient and very encouraging and nurturing for the reading to come online. And he learned to talk late. He also learned to read late. And so we really kind of had to let that come along at its pace. And I think if we tried to force things and rush things, I think we would have had a very different outcome in terms of his orientation to reading. And I, and I see that all the time with, with families that I work with. Thank you. I, it's something we all have to work on. Well, it is. <laughs> Whether again, you have a late talker or not, but yeah. I, yeah. There's a, there's a, I think this is true, but I, I'm not positive, but my understanding, there was a psychologist named Jean Piaget who did stages of cognitive development, really good work actually. And he, he called it the American question because he'd come to America. He was a Swiss psychologist. He would, he would come to America and he would, he would like do a lecture and then everybody would say, well, how can you speed it up? You know? And so <laughs> it was like, you know, he's like, why would you want to speed it up, you know? But certainly here in America with our, all the benefits of our competitive society in some ways, that idea that we have to accelerate learning to, sure. to the extreme really can be very detrimental to late talkers. So patience is important. Well, thank you, Steve. In our next podcast, we're going to talk about the Einstein syndrome, a special category of late talking children who are exceptionally bright from an early age. So please join us here next week. In the meantime, we want to hear from you. Ask us a question in the comment section. Be sure to click subscribe and hit that bell. And you can always check out the Late Talkers Foundation website. And always remember, the best thing for your child is you. <laughs>